Mr. Wicker's Window by Carly Dawson, Chapter 10, Part 1. The learning of magic was by no means easy. The days went by with Chris's mornings and afternoons spent in Mr. Wicker's study, reading books too heavy for him to lift, learning incantations by heart and how to blend simple formulae over the fire. He had told his master at once about Simon Gosler, his hoard of money and his hiding places for it. Mr. Wicker, though interested and attentive, gave Chris the impression that what he had been told was not new to him. At times, Chris was allowed to run about the large vegetable garden and climb the orchard trees, but he was told that the moment had not yet come when he could wander at will in early Georgetown. Chris had tried it once, rebellious and bored at the now familiar ground, but it was as if an invisible wall kept him in the confines of Mr. Wicker's land, a slippery glass wall he could feel but not see, in which he could discover no chink in which to put his toe to uh, find the weight of it. So there was nothing left to do but work as fast as well as he could. There are rumors, Mr. Wicker had told him quietly, too quietly, that Claggett Chew is preparing a ship, the Venture, for a voyage east. There's much activity about his ship, and he's laying in stores, so I am informed. We must get aboard with all haste, but a ship is a fast one, faster than the Mirabelle. Chris, therefore, threw himself into all the preliminaries from his task. His head swam when he led aided on his pillow at night, and Becky Boozer would stand with her hands on her barrel-sized tips, chasing her hat uh, until its plumes and roses waved madly over her balls, shadowed eyes, and weary hair. For Chris was now as an accepted a member of the household as Mr. Wicker himself, and had it not been for the robust guffaws of Ned Silly and the ministrations of a now but devoted Becky, Chris's days would have been tedious indeed. One afternoon, when he returned after a rest to Mr. Wicker's study, he saw that there was something new in the room. A bowl with a goldfish in it stood on the table, but Mr. Wicker's not to be seen. Now, however, Chris was not the boy he had been a few weeks before. He went straight to the bowl and addressed the fish. Sir, he said to the goldfish, I am here. What shall I do first? The goldfish might have almost said to have changed its expression and smiled before brushing a drop of water from his sleeve. Mr. Wicker stood beside the table, smiling. How you've improved, my boy, he explained. It is now time for you to try, and this is as good a change as any. All at once, at the imminent prospect of really changing himself into some other form, Chris became frightened, and his hands grew cold. Oh, sir, do you really think I know how? He cried, gazing up at the face of his master. Suppose I change it and can't change back. Mr. Wicker shook his head with a smile. Never fear, Christopher. You shall never know enough to start, and I feel reasonably sure you will be quite able to change back again. If you get stuck, I can help you. Come now he said, putting out his hand to touch Chris's shoulder in a reassuring way. Here you go. Remember Incantation 73, Book 1. Chris stared at the fishbowl, empty now. He remembered Incantation 73, Book 1, quite well, but his knees began to tremble. And he stood as if paralyzed. Mr. Wicker waited patiently beside him for a few moments for Chris to get up his courage. Then, as nothing happened with a voice like a whip, Mr. Wicker said, Start at once! Chris was so startled at his usually gentle master's tone that without further thought or effort on his part, he began intoning to himself the words and sounds of Incantation 73, Book 1, as he went on concentrating on becoming a goldfish in the bowl on the table. He became aware of a humming sensation in his head. This grew until it seemed that all his body was filled with a strange new vibration, tingling from his feet to the crown of his head. The sensation spread faster and faster. His head swam, and he felt faint and a little sick, but he persisted through the final words. Somewhere deep inside him there seemed a sudden lurch, then a wonderfully cool, liquid sensation. He had felt buoyant and rested and looked about, only to get a wavering, enlarging glimpse of Mr. Wicker, looking more like a reflection in a circus mirror than himself. With a light twist of his body, Chris floated over to see that the room looked the same, and rolling back, could see that Mr. Wicker was peering at him from above and smiling broadly. Lord, I'm a fish! Seduce said, and he heard the words muffled as they came back to him through the water of the bowl's bowl. 
Well, what do you know, he thought, not without a feeling of pride, and commenced experimenting with his tail and fins with such enthusiasm and delight that some little time elapsed before Mr. Werger's voice boomed close by. Better come back now. Take it slowly, son. 74, book one. The Return. The same strange sensations flooded Chris as he made the change back to his own shape. When he stood once more on his own two feet on the carpet in Mr. Wicker's study, he was pleased and happy despite his weakness. Mr. Wicker took his hold of his arm and helped him into a chair, and taking a small vial from the cupboard at the end of the room, he dropped a pellet into it and handed it to Chris. This will seem to smoke. Sniff the smoke and drink the liquid that remains, he said. Chris did as he was told and his momentary weakness vanished, leaving him quiet and as strong as usual. There now, Mr. Wicker said, rubbing his hands with immense satisfaction. That was not so bad, was it? A peculiar feeling. But as you come to do it more often and more quickly, the change will come more rapidly, and in time you will be scarcely aware of the sensations at all. He looked at his pupil with pride. You will do famously, my boy. In another moment, when you have rested, we shall try another one. From that time, Chris became increasingly proficient, and as his ability grew, he began to find magic a wonderful game, which he and Mr. Wicker played together. They played this new and unique form of hide-and-seek, each one taking a new shape, turn by turn, as a challenge to the other's powers of imagination and detection. Soon, Chris could turn himself into a limited number of things, for even Mr. Wicker's magic had a limit. A singing bird in a cage, a part of a pattern on the brocaded curtains, or section of the design in the Indian rug. The blue bottle flyer of the goldfish became as easy as saying, Eureka! And on one occasion, Chris turned himself into the chair on which Mr. Wicker was sitting, and then walked across the room on his four wooden legs, carrying Mr. Wicker, who laughed more heartily than he had in years this display on the part of his student. End of part one.